Um, am I good, Mike? Yes. Uh, so thanks for coming to my talk. I'm Lisa. I'm going to talk today about design tips for making long-form games, and I'm going to cover a lot of information. Uh, so I'm going to go a little quick through my slides, but uh, don't worry, the slides will be available directly after the talk. So if you're the sort of person that snaps slides, don't don't worry about it if you if you miss one. Uh, so. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Who am I? My name is Lisa. I have been a game designer for over 10 years now. I'm currently a senior sandbox designer at Bungie. Uh, that's the team that does player systems like weapons and armor and abilities. And uh, I've made a lot of games in my career. On one hand, I've worked on big AAA games with team sizes in the hundreds. I've done a lot of game jams and side projects that are very small, like one to three person teams. And I've done some games that are sort of in the middle, like medium-sized games, which are a little more relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today. So when I say long-form game, all I'm talking about is a game that's meant to be played across multiple sessions. And specifically, I'm thinking of folks who maybe have done a lot of game jams or really small focused projects uh, who are maybe having their first attempt at making a bigger game or you know, just who, who sometimes struggle with like moving into making bigger games. So for an example, imagine you've just done a game jam and your game jam was really well received and you think it has a lot of potential as a prototype and a bunch of people are like, oh, you should make this for reals. And so you're like, yeah, all right, yeah, let's do it. And you sit down to figure out how to make it into a full-fledged game. And when I talk to folks who are in this situation, I noticed a common trend of people getting stuck uh, they often get stuck on this. What do I work on first? There's so much that goes into making a bigger game. Even for people who have made big games before, uh, this post-prototype paralysis can come up when you think, you know, what am I supposed to work on first? What's the best thing to do first? Uh, and so why do we care about this? Well, it's really hard. Making big games is, is hard. And if you look out there as far as resources and advice, there's a lot of resources for people getting started making games. Uh, a lot of things about like how to polish that core mechanic, find the fun, and all that. And there's good resources for solving specific problems. But there's kind of a gap of information on that intermediate step of moving from game jams and single session games to bigger projects. And like I said, the most common issue I see is people get stuck. They're not sure if they're working on the right thing that they should be working on first. And it can feel like you're doing a ton of work on your game but not really going anywhere. So the goal of this talk is to give you some tools, uh, a variety of tools for getting yourself unstuck if you're facing this situation. So to that end, uh, I'm gonna assume that, I'm gonna go in assuming you know some stuff already and have some experience doing certain things. I'm gonna assume you know how to you know, find the fun in a core mechanic, how to really focus in and come up with a solid game loop uh, I'm going to assume you've made at least some projects, like done some game jams, done some student projects, done some you know smaller vignette experiences at least. And basically, this is sort of an intermediate level talk, so keep that in mind. And this is going to be a design-focused talk. Uh, there's a lot of things related to making bigger games that I'm not going to cover. I'm not going to cover production tips. This is stuff about like scheduling and scope management. I'm not going to be talking about the business side, like pitching to publishers or anything like that. And I'm not gonna be covering technical tips like project structure or build management. This is purely a design focused talk. All right, so with that, um, gonna go forward. So quick question, how many of you have heard this advice about, about making a game, about answering this question? What's the fantasy your game is fulfilling? Who's heard this before? All right, this is a very common piece of advice. Uh, for, for people, and you're gonna find that it's something really helpful at all stages of game development as a sort of a gate check. Uh, you're gonna see me reference this idea a lot. Uh, so here's a, examples of what I mean by what's the fantasy of your game. Fantasies can be really simple, like you know the fantasy of being a soldier in World War II, or the fantasy of being Spider-Man, or the fantasy of being a border control agent in a dystopian authoritarian regime trying to balance the moral ambiguity of doing your job by the same time keeping your family safe. You know, not all games are power fantasies, but it's like that, that core element of the experience of your game. Uh, for examples about games I made, uh, a few years ago I gave a talk about Imaginal, which is a game I made about catching lightning bugs. 
But even though the action is, oh, you're catching lightning bugs, the fantasy of the game is about spending time with me. It's about, you know, having a quiet evening chatting with me. Uh, and another example of a game I made several years ago, there's this, this is an action game called Slow Down Bull. And you play as a bull who runs around and collects decorations for his art. Uh, but the fantasy was all about being a stressed out overachiever. Uh, I'm going to use this, this game in a lot of examples, so I'll show it in a bit. So your core fantasy is really important because it acts as a foundation for the rest of your game. But my first tip is an observation I have uh, for people who tackle their first long form game and get stuck. So this is especially for folks who like maybe have a really solid uh, game jam game or a strong prototype that want to make bigger. Almost all of these developers do a pretty good job of figuring out like what's the core fantasy of their game, and yet they still get stuck. So this year at GDC, Jesse Shell gave a micro talk featuring Jason Vandenberg, so it's like double design wisdom in a single talk. Uh, the talk was called Obey the Story Stack, and uh, you can check it out on the vault when you have the chance, but it's a, a really good talk, and I'm going to uh, pull an element from it that I think is relevant here. The gist of the talk is that these elements of a game, the ones at the top are more flexible and the ones at the bottom are least flexible. So we have like the core fantasy there at the bottom and uh, you know, we look at it, whoops, do, 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 the, we will look at it and um, a lot of people, you know, they figure this out uh, and they, a lot of people also do this really well, the action part of the stack where they, they you know, get, get a solid gameplay loop that supports the fantasy. But here's where I think people get stuck. A lot of times you see people, you know, they have these solid things, and then they jump straight up here to like world and story. You know, what's the story of the game? What's the setting? What, are, what is the story we're telling? Um, and that's, that's a common thing for people to do. But, you know, they skip a step. So what about our friend economy here? So, you know, this is stacked from least flexible to most flexible. And what happens if you, if you skip this middle chunk, uh, you, you can get a little shaky and a lot of times I see people getting stuck because they're making story decisions that support their action and economy, but don't have a sense, or the action and fantasy, but don't have a sense of what the economy of their game is. And they'll get into these situations where they have to go back and retrofit the economy to a story and it sometimes doesn't make sense and they get a little paralyzed. So that brings my first tip, which is thinking about the economy of your game upfront. And you might think like, oh, economy, oh, it's like spreadsheets and math and ugh, oh, it's not fun. The story part's fun. Figuring out the story's fun. Figuring out the world is fun. Uh, but do not worry because in this case, when I'm talking about economy, I'm talking at a very high level, uh, something very simple, which is thinking about these questions. If you're feeling stuck and you haven't thought about this, uh, think about, you know, what does the player earn in your game? Uh, how, how do they get stronger? How does the player advance in your game? You know, it's a very simple thing, just like what is the player earning? And the best part is, is if you start to think about these questions and figure out these questions, it makes figuring out uh, the story a, a lot easier because it has a better foundation to support it. So I'm gonna show you an example about this game, Slow Down Bull. I'm gonna alt tab over and show you this game. This was a, a game I made at Insomniac with like four other people. It was like a experimental small game. Yeah, and it's an action game. game is it's a two button game. There's only two buttons in the game. So he runs on his own and all you do is steer him. But every time you steer him he gets a little a little more stressed out. Uh, so it's all about like managing your stress level. You're trying to collect all these little bits for your art and move around. But if you get too stressed out then you lose control and you rampage and you might run into something and lose all the bits you collected. It feels really bad about it because you're just trying to do really good but it's stressful. Uh, and that's basically the gist of this game. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun to make. Um, so, you know, the fantasy of this game is being a stressed out overachiever. Uh, so, uh, let's break this down a little bit uh, when it comes to the story stack. So the fantasy of the game, 
stressed out overachiever, wants to be perfect, worry is gonna screw up, uh, constant fear of losing control. The way the action supports this is the very act of moving in the game, the steering is, is stressful, right? You, it's like the only way you can control your character, but you have to manage it so you don't stress out. And you have to collect a lot of these little bits because you're trying to go for perfection. Uh, so the way the economy comes into play is like, okay, like, you know, this bowls an artist, he has to collect the most, the most like decorations, ingredients for its art. And so that means, you know, he has to earn more bits to advance. That's how you advance in the game. You just earn, you collect more stuff, you earn more stuff. Uh, and, you know, for a while we, we, there, we could have gone with a different economy, right? We could have gone for like, oh, you know, you have to collect, there's a limited number of bits in the level and you have to collect them all. And that sort of supports the perfection part of the fantasy. But uh, we found that going for like pure volume, just trying to get as many as possible, uh, really like supported that stressful part of the fantasy and the part where an overachiever is never satisfied because they always feel like they could be doing better. So it's like little details like that uh, that come into play. So let's look at how the story came to be and how it relates to to this economy and these bits. And uh, not only does it support the economy, but it, it gives us a reason for why you move from area to area. So, you know, story, Esteban, that's the name of the bull. He's collecting bits to, to use to make his art. The more he collects, the more likely he is to find the perfect decorations for his crafts, because they have to be perfect. Uh, but he's an overachiever, so every time he succeeds in collecting one type of bit, uh, he's distracted by a new type that he thinks is even better and seeks to collect that one instead. So that's why he spends all this time collecting one type and then he sees another one and moves on to the next area and works on collecting that one. Uh, so it ended up working together really well. But this process, uh, it wasn't straightforward because at the time when I was working on this, I didn't really have that fantasy figured out yet. I was really focusing on the mechanics at the time. You know, I was trying to figure out, oh, can you make an action game with mastery and depth with just two buttons? Like, that's what I was focused on. And so the fantasy was really vague, so we went through a lot of really terrible story ideas because we didn't have that sense of economy. Like, the first one, I think, was that, like, you're a bull and Ferdinand the bull is, like, your hero, and so you collect flowers because he's your hero. And then there was this one where, like, we are on a farm and, like, there was a tornado or something and the farm got destroyed and so you were gonna help rebuild the farm by collecting things and it was not great. It was like, and then there was like a mortgage man you could chase away. It was, it was very big. It didn't make any sense uh, because the fantasy wasn't there yet. It wasn't strong enough. Um, but once that fantasy coalesced, uh, things started falling into a place. It was all about this this idea that he was worried always if he wasn't doing good, good enough. Uh, and so that fit into the action, the stress mechanic, and it helped the economy come together, it helped the story come together. So uh, it was really important to, to figure that out. It's not always straightforward though. So back to thinking about player economies, here's some examples of sort of high level player economies that you know, you can think about when, when you're thinking about your game, like, you know, maybe you're collecting a currency so you can buy upgrades, or maybe you're looking for items that make you more powerful. Like in Zelda, you know, you find these specific items that let you advance that give you more power. Or maybe, like in an RPG, you're earning levels to improve stats, or maybe you're just like simply earning access to the next challenge. Like, you do a hard level so you can beat it and go on to the next level. There's, there's, these are the sorts of things I'm thinking about. Uh, and I want to point out that my expertise is in action games, so a lot of my examples involve action games. But whatever your economy is, it needs to support your gameplay and your fantasy. It's not always going to be about getting more powerful or collecting currency. And one of example of this that I really like is this idea of information as economy. In games like Oberdin or Shrouded Isle, the thing the player is earning to advance is information. And that's what helps you like get through the game. So, you know, there's a lot of like, you don't be tempted to be like, oh, a lot of games have collections, so I should have a collection. Now you've got to think about, well, what's the fantasy or game? What's going to support that? Okay, so again, here's the questions to think about economy. What do you earn? How does the player get stronger? How do they advance? And then thinking about what economy is right for your fantasy. So that was one problem. Uh, here is the next one I see a lot. Um, 
you know, if your core, if you have your core action in fantasy and you start figuring out the answers to economy, uh, the next part I see people getting stuck is figuring out just a structure that supports that. And one example is a good friend of mine who is really good at making like really good feeling action games, and he made you know multiplayer action fighting games, and um, he wanted to turn his multiplayer game that was very successful into a single player game, but he got totally stuck because even though he was really good at making that core feel of the fighting game, he's just like I don't know how to approach, like how do you make the rest of it? Like how do you decide what? What you, how it fits together. And so the next step, I'm gonna talk about thinking about progression and gates. Uh, and again, this is very high level. Uh, when I talk about progression, I just mean, how are your chunks of gameplay glued together? If you have a core gameplay loop, thinking about you know, how does it, how are they going to go from one to the other? And how does this work with the economy you have? And then for gates, all I mean are, well, what are the obstacles that your player has to overcome in order to progress? And a lot of times if you make a game for a game jam, your progression is very simple because often that's meant to be played in a single session. So you're like, okay, I'm just gonna have a string of levels together and that's the game. Um, but where people get stuck is if they are building on top of that game jam prototype, assuming that that's just the way the game should be because that's the way you happen to do it without giving it some more thought first. So here's a few examples of progression structures that you often see in games. There's like the linear structure where it's just, you beat a level, you go to the next level and they're strung together in a linear fashion. You'll see things, especially in puzzle games where you, know, you do a level and it unlocks a set of other levels you can do in any order, but to unlock more, you have to like complete a certain amount. So there's some choice, there's self-contained levels, but how the rest of them unlocks uh, is a little more of choice. Uh, classic hub and spoke style games like Dark Souls 2 is an example of this where you have a central area um, and then branch off and choose to you know do accomplish certain other areas that might be stringed together um, and returning to the hub open world games you know these are games where there's just it's just everything is in the game at the same time and you're just sort of fluidly transitioning from part to part uh, and so, you know, thinking, th these aren't the only progression structures, but this is sort of what I mean when I'm talking about how is, how are those the core loop of your game? How are those chunks fit together? And then when we talk about gates, uh, you should all, you talk about, you know, what is blocking your player from progressing? Maybe you have a structure you like, and you gotta think about, okay, what, what's, what it needs to be overcome for the player to advance? And some common ones are just straight up completion, like you can't, access new parts of the game until you complete earlier parts. Um, there's like straight up player skill, like in difficult skill-based games, just having to overcome a certain challenge in order to move further. There's the old lock and key, like you have to find, explore and find a certain item to unlock a space or maybe solve a puzzle. Uh, there's lock and key that's based on like player abilities that they earn. You see this a lot in Metroidvania style games where you can't get through this barricade until you learn the green uppercut because it's green or, you, you know, stuff like that where it's basically lock and key but it's centralized around what the player can do. Uh, crafting can be a gate in a lot of games uh, where you have to collect certain tokens to combine to create the key. Uh, Monster Hunter is an example of a game that does this. So lots of examples of thinking about, you know, what what can block your player once you figure out progression. So back to slow down bull. So we reached a point in this game where we were, we're definitely sure that the game should be structured in like a series of self-contained levels. But we were brainstorming about how those levels should be grouped together. And we thought of a lot of different things like, you know, maybe it was just a simple linear structure and you followed a linear path. Or we had this weird idea of like, area structures with unlocking sectors and branching paths so you could choose where to go is like super complicated. We spent a lot of time brainstorming structures of how these levels could be grouped together. Uh, and in the end, we decided uh, on this area structure where you know, we'd have a series of levels together, you'd have some choice in how you can progress, uh, but you have to complete the whole area to move to the next chunk. So you know, that was pretty good.
uh, we liked that. Um, but we kind of ran into a problem where we were thinking about the gate, like what is the reason you can't move to the next area right away? Like what, we could just go with the gamey thing of, oh, you just have to collect a certain amount because games, and then you can go forward. But we really wanted to try and figure out a more intuitive way to explain why you couldn't advance. Um, so we were like, oh, maybe there's like a toll booth and you have to pay a certain amount of the bits you collect before you can go forward. Or maybe it's like a physical gate and you have to like fill up a bucket to like make the gate open. Uh, all these weird ideas that weren't working. So in the end, we were like, okay, let's go back to the fantasy and figure this out. So, you know, our fantasy, being stressed out over Achiever, the economy was collecting the perfect pieces for your art. Uh, the progression structure was completing new areas to find more perfect pieces. So what was the game? And we realized, well, you know, this is all about being an overachiever. And, you know, when you're an overachiever, you have ridiculously high standards for yourself. So we just decided, like, the thing that was blocking Esteban from going to the next level was just, like, he didn't think he'd done well enough yet. And he just wouldn't go until he felt like he was doing well enough. And it ended up being really great because we didn't have to do anything. We just threw on a little bit of story and had a nice little explanation for, you know, why you couldn't go forward. He, uh, he wouldn't let you. And, um, you know, one, one thing about, like, figuring stuff out like this is it makes it really easy to know where to spend polish time later on. So, for example, uh, at our end level screen, if you don't get, like, the third stamp, he plays this little animation where he's like, like clearly distressed that he didn't do the absolute best that he could have done on this level, and it's just like a little, a little polish piece, uh, but it it helps reinforce the fantasy. And so thinking about these things and how they support each other just makes it easier to know like where to spend that time polishing up. All right, so progression and gates, uh, these are the things you can ask yourself uh, when thinking about this aspect. How can the chunks of my gameplay be glued together? What prevents the player from progression between chunks of gameplay? And how do these things tie back to that, that base fantasy? All right, here's another place where I see people getting stuck a lot when making their first long core games. And a buddy of mine from graduate school, Albert Shee, graciously gave me permission to use his game as an example of this project. Albert is working on the Museum of Simulation Technology. Has anyone heard of this game before? A couple people. Uh, if you've never seen this game, it has a really cool premise. It's all about manipulating the perspective of a first-person game to control the size of objects and use that to solve puzzles. Uh, and this was a student project, and it showed really well. Everyone who played the demo of it was really excited about it. It was like, oh, you guys, you, you should make this for real. And they were like, all right, let's do it. Let's make it for reals. Um, and I'd seen the game at a show, and I was visiting Carnegie Mellon, and I was chatting with the team, and I asked them, you know, what's the hardest thing about making this game? And the thing they told me at the time was, you know, even though they'd had uh, a series of really cool puzzles in the demos with this bonkers mechanic that was really unique, when they started trying to expand it into a bigger game, they discovered that the amount of variations they could do with that mechanic dried up way faster than they expected. So their biggest struggle at the time was figuring out, well, how do we make enough content for a big game that doesn't get stale? Because it turns out like there's only a certain number of puzzles you can do with this mechanic. And so they, they got super stuck and it was a big sticking point for them at a the time to figure out how to expand this. So my third tip for cutting this sort of problem off at the pass is to spend time thinking about variations up front uh, for your game. Uh, Dan Cook at Spry Fox, uh, he likes to say that most big games are an X minute content chunk times in variations. So thinking about how many ways your core gameplay loop can be spun with a significant variation is a good exercise to do really early on. Dan also says this, he says at Spry Fox, we have a whole stage of prototyping before we go into production called variation exploration with the goal of making sure we have rich, rich, robust core systems that can yield enough variations for a big, maybe running for years game. So um, variations, if you, they, they dry up fast. You, you can have like a vague sort of, oh yeah, there's definitely a lot I can do with this. But until you sit down and start trying to think of specifics, uh, 
um, you run the risk of having that run out of juice super fast. So, you know, can you fill up a single page with just like specific ideas of variations on your core gameplay? And if you do this exercise and find out that you can't, you know, maybe you should think about like, well, maybe this should actually be a small game instead of a big game. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some game mechanics shine way, way better as small one-shot experiences, and that's okay. But it's good to figure this out first before you start putting a lot of development into your game and realizing that you don't have enough ooh, to stretch. Uh, so back when I made Slow Down Bull, uh, I did this process. Uh, I'd figured out, this was like the super early prototype. We'd figure it out. Uh, we liked the, the weird two button steering. We would figured out collection was the thing and we figured out that stress mechanic uh, and that made up the core gameplay chunk. So I scheduled a big chunk of time to just prototype and see what variations I could come up with on that core mechanic. And I was looking back at my uh, design log for this game and looking up entries and I found like all these entries where I was just prototyping all kinds of like random things and saying like what worked, what didn't, like all sorts of things. So I spent a lot of time on, on this. And you know, some of the things I thought of was like, oh maybe there's not just a bull, maybe you can play other animals and they have different stats and that changes how you play. Or maybe there's different game modes, you know, like, you know, maybe there's a game mode where you have to like collect three of the same type of thing and it turns into a bigger thing and, you know, lots of different pickups. Maybe they all did different things. And, you know, I prototyped a lot of stuff. Uh, some of it worked, some of it was like not, no, they were just weren't fun ideas. But at the end of the process, I had enough potential variations that I, I felt confident. I was like, okay, I can definitely expand this and make this fill up a, a big game. And I used this image in a postmortem talk about this, this project, showing these two months of prototyping variations. Uh, and like this was like the point in time where I tried different things. And the big bold ones were like, oh, okay, this is solid, we gotta do this. And then you see grayed out things, which were stuff I tried that just totally didn't work. And the key thing I wanna point out here is that, you know, some of the variations I tried super late ended up being the solid ones that wound up in the final game. Uh, but at the same time, I was also prototyping things very late that just did just were cut, weren't work, didn't work out at all. It was a, a process that lasted the whole time span. And in the end, it was it was cool to see like some of the things that I came up in that early two month variation prototyping that did end up in the final game. And like I said, more than anything, this exercise gave me confidence. It meant we could do a lot of the work building the structure of the final game without worrying that we weren't gonna have enough to fill it out. So unlike the past few tips, this tip about variation exploration, it's more of a preventative measure for getting stuck than a tool for actually getting unstuck. And the hope is by doing this, you'll know really early on if your core mechanic has enough juice and variation to last through a multi-session game structure. All right, problem number four. Um, so this is another thing I've encountered a lot when talking to people making big games, uh, and it's a trend with like people who put crafting in their game. So I've worked with like several teams who they want to make a game with crafting, and they have they have a prototype, and um, I play the prototype, and I'm able to unlock everything I can make in the game in like ten minutes, and I'm like, well. You know, how long do you expect people to be playing this game? Because right now I can get it all right away. And if this is supposed to be a core tenet of your game, you should probably like expand it out. And they're like, oh yeah. And you know, they they thought they, they would definitely want crafting, but they hadn't given a lot of thought to how long they expected their players to be playing this game. Uh, and so it it meant that they had like thrown out everything all at once, and you know, you hit that cap of what there was to do in the game like super fast. So um, a tip for thinking about this problem is to think about sessions and how the player is playing your game over time. So if our definition of a long form game is a game that's played across multiple sessions, uh, I'm gonna go back to that thing that Dan Cook said. He said, most big games are just an X minute content chunk times N variations. And this is focused on that, that front part, the X minute content chunk. Um, Basically think, how long do you expect a player to stay in your game before taking a break? Uh, that's, that's all it is, uh, is thinking about that up front. 
And there's lots of different like session types in games. There's games where you like sit down, you play for hours, just like, you know, getting super into it before you take a break. And there's small little games where you can pop open and play for a couple minutes, like if you're super busy. Uh, games with variable session length, I think idle games are a good example of this because idle games are a type of game that you can, you can sit there and you can play for hours or you can pop it open and have a play session of like 30 seconds and be done. So games with super variable lengths. Uh, you often hear about the lunch break game, like people who are like, I wanna make a game that someone can play on their lunch break. Uh, Into the Breach is an example of this. It has, you know, you can complete, complete a campaign in like, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and you see this a lot, uh, thinking about, well, when do you expect players to be playing your game? And that will sort of influence what you think about your sessions. Um, you have game, multiplayer games, a lot of competitive multiplayer games, you know, they have fixed length matches. So that's a, an easier way to figure out sessions. You know, you think, well, how many matches do I expect a player to be playing before they take a break? And if my matches are three minutes long, you know, what, is that, what does that look like over a span of time? So here's some questions that you can answer about your game when it comes to sessions. Um, what's the length of a session? How long, like literally in minutes, do you expect a player to be in there before taking a break? How frequently do you expect players to play? And thinking about those variations, how are those variations spread across sessions? Like how long before a player encounters a new mechanic? Um, when it comes to progression and economy, these questions are really helpful to say like, all right, in my game, every session, the player X, where X is some part of the economy. Like every session, my player probably gains like three levels or you know, discovers three new areas or, you know, dies twice probably if they're a mid-tier player. Like thinking about uh, the whole, what do they earn, how do they advance? Um, so every session the player does X and then so every few sections the player does X and then every longer time span the player does X. Uh, doing this exercise really helps you get a feel for how what you have can stretch across a multi-session uh, play style. And I find it a really useful exercise. Uh, so those were all of the tips, uh, but I wanna give some caveats to when you're doing these exercises and thinking about these tips. When you're like answering these questions, you're not actually looking for answers. You're looking for more questions. This isn't the sort of thing where you go through and you answer these questions in order and you're done, your game is figured out and it's all you know figured out. No, this is more about finding, prompting yourself to look for unknowns in your game that you need to solve. So you might think, oh, it looks like this. You got your fantasy in the middle there. You think about variations, you think about economy, you think about them all separately, and then you're done. But what you'll find is when you do this exercise, you might be thinking of economy and that'll influence something about how you were thinking about progression. Or maybe you thought about some gates and you're like, oh, actually, if I do it this way, I should change how my economy works to this. And you know, you're thinking about variations, and that makes you think about, you know, how your sessions are laid out and which affects your progression. And basically, the more you do this exercise, the more you will, like, interlink and think of, uh, you know, multiple things about all of these categories. So I'm going to do an example. I'm going to show you a Game Jam game I did, and for the purposes of example, pretend that I want to take that Game Jam game and make it a, uh, a bigger game. So this game is called Prop Hell. It's about uh, my experiences in the theater. If anyone's ever worked in the theater, you know that prop storages are always haunted. So uh, it's, a, it's a procedurally generated game. You, uh, you, you know, wander around. Oh, this is gonna be hard to do here. I'll do like this, yeah. Uh, you wander around this dungeon looking for props. Uh, you can pick stuff up and throw it. Um, because prop dungeons are haunted, there's golems down here that they attach props to themselves and you have to throw things at them to, to knock it down. Uh, you're, you know, it gets dark. Oh, there's one down here. Oh, get him. Oh, missed. And, you know, he's got like, oh, he had something on him, so I had to knock it off. Throw a chair at him. Got um, but as you go deeper in the dungeon, it gets darker, so you gotta find props that have light attached to them. Ooh, 
away. You can set them places to light up a whole area. And, you know, with the golems have different things, like if a golem gets a, a, ba a bucket of cutlery attached to its arm, it can throw projectiles at you. You know, it's, it's, it's a really systemic game like that. And I had a lot of fun making this game. That's a chair. Um, and you're just exploring this procedurally generated area, trying to find this one particular prop and bring it, bring it back to the entrance. Um, and I had a lot of fun making this game. Oh gosh, that guy has a lot of stuff. Oh. Um, it was, it was fun to make. I like had a bunch of surprises making it. Um, and you know, it was, it was a good game jam game. So let's say I'm like, you know, I really like that game. I want to make that for reals. I'm going to make this a big, like, you know, roguelike, uh, game. Um, so we get to that thing of like, all right, I'm going to make this for reals. What should I work on first? And as an action game designer, here are my instincts of what I want to work on first. I'm like, oh, I could make more interesting props that have different functions, different abilities. Um, the controls are kind of, they're kind of garbage, so I could spend a lot of time making the controls good. Um, that procedural level builder, I could work on making it vary so it can generate different types of levels. The UI is terrible in this. I need to figure out the UI. You know, oh, I can make different types of enemies. Like maybe they move different, or maybe you know uh, they have different abilities and, and all this stuff. And I have to like make myself stop here, because the thing is about all of these things, all of my instincts of what to do first. I am confident, like I can figure all this out. Like I make controls good for a living. I there, there's I I don't know how to do it right now, but I'm confident I could I could figure that out. And a piece of advice I often give to beginners is don't be lured by finite problem spaces. I see beginners a lot, you know, when they're making a game, they'll get caught up on something that they know when it's done. Like I had a, ment a mentee once who was making this game and he got caught up on this, this part where like the audio had to fit under a certain size. So he's spending all this time working on audio compression in his game. And I was like, well, is the game fun yet? And I was like, well, you know, I just figured I'd do this first because I knew I know when it's done, right? You know when it's finished. But that can be a bad move because, you know, you want to spend your time on the hard problems. And a similar piece of advice to intermediates is don't be lured by problems that you know you can solve. Like, I know I can make those enemies hard and fun. Like I know I can. So I don't need to spend my time on that up front. What I'm doing is I need to look for the hardest questions that I don't know the answers to. And so that's what uh, finding those hard questions is going to guide me on what I should work on first. So um, I'm going to walk you through uh, the ex all these exercises I did with this game. I was on a train from San Francisco to Seattle, and I just jammed all this out. So I'm going to show a lot of information. I'm not going to necessarily go through it all. I mostly want to see, want you to see like the thought process that I was going through when thinking about these things. So of course I started with the fantasy. What is the fantasy of prop hell? Like, you know, so I to think about what did, what did I like about this game? Uh, I liked the fact that you're, you know, you're fine. You're a prop designer. You're finding props in a haunted storage using only your wits and your surroundings. Like you have to use the props that you find around you to solve your problems. And I really liked that aspect of it. And so, okay, how does the action support this? Well, there's really high stakes. This is a permadeath game. Uh, there's a lot of improvisation. There's procedural level generation. The props are procedural. So there's a lot of like, you know, trying to figure out what you can do with what you have at the time. And that supports that fantasy. And there's no inherent abilities. Like Prop Girl doesn't have like stats or power or skills. She just uses the props she finds to do everything. And I liked that aspect a lot. So I was on my train ride. I filled out like pages and pages of, of my notebook trying to brainstorm about this. Uh, so the first thing I tackled was economy. You know, what does the player earn in this game? I was like, well, maybe I just jotted down some things. Like maybe you earn access. Maybe you get a currency when you kill monsters to buy upgrades. Maybe you like get different abilities, or maybe you earn clues about stuff. Um, I don't know. Maybe you earn knowledge about the plays you're working on. I don't know. It's just like a quick brainstorm list. And then I went back to my fantasy, and I really identified, well, what are the key points of this fantasy? Um, it's about finding props. It's about solving problems with your wits and your surroundings and nothing else. So I use this as sort of a razor to go back on these economy ideas. 
I was like, okay, access. Access to what? Well, you know, maybe access to new props. That's all about finding new props, so maybe that would work. Uh, the currency thing, I was like, no, this isn't right because, you know, this is supposed to be using about what's around you, not like upgrading yourself. Um, abilities, like, well, I don't want the prop girl to have any abilities, but maybe like the props themselves have abilities, and so access to those props is is what you're earning, and then you know that ties back into the access thing, so that worked out pretty well. And I was like, well, you know, thinking about clues, thinking about other stuff is just sort of a go back through and measure this against what the fantasy was. So in the end, I was like, okay, prop girls get stronger by access to stronger props that give her abilities. The props act as keys to get access to new areas, which then have stronger props. And using the props helps her survive the prop golems. Um, so basically, this gave me a constraint um, that prop girl herself never gets stronger, only gets access to more things in her environment that she can use. So then I started thinking about progression and gates. Um, you know, I went back to this sort of thing of the economy, and then I brainstormed parts of this. So I was like, well, access is important. What does that mean? Different abilities, you know, what are abilities you could have? What does keys mean? You know, just brainstorming out a bunch of stuff. And then I thought, well, you know, what's, what's blocking her from progressing? You know, completing a dungeon, the, her actual player skill when defeating these golems because you can't get past them. And then maybe props can act as keys for locks. Just sort of brainstorming structures, like, oh, maybe it's like a linear structure. And, you know, I just went through a bunch of different potential structures, listing the pros and the cons. How does this fit with the fantasy? How doesn't it? You know, all, all different ideas, just jamming out stuff. So then I took a moment to think about variations uh, and how I could vary this core mechanic. Uh, there are variations in how the dungeon could be constructed. You know, maybe le the levels were different thought of variations in what different props could do, uh, thought about variations in how the enemies behave, like how do they attack? What about how the enemies use props? Here's some idea, different ideas how they could use props. Uh, I even thought about like, well, maybe there's different modes, like you know, maybe there's a mode where you just have to survive for a certain amount of time, you know, just listed some things out. And by the end of it, I was like, okay, there's a lot of stuff here. This is a systemic game. I have a lot of variations. I definitely could expand this out into a full game. So then I thought about sessions, and this one was hard for me. Um, you know, I was just making stuff up. What's the length of the session? I don't know. Maybe you play for 15 minutes. I don't know. You know, thinking about these up front, you're not trying to answer this for your game right away. It's just getting you to think about it. And when I thought about this part, I was like, okay, every few sessions, you know, maybe they complete a certain amount of dungeons. Maybe earlier dungeons go faster. You know, maybe they find at least one power prop. And I was like, okay, every few sessions, maybe they complete this many dungeons. And like, what does it mean like, mo like when you get way in there? Like I hadn't really thought about what the deep end part of the game was. And then I thought about, okay, so if I think a session is 20 minutes, then you know, this loop would last like three hours. Is that what I want? Do I want a longer game? And if so, I've got to like spread this out more. and. Um, you know, just it, I wasn't making decisions here. I was just thinking about uh, these sessions. And uh, some other thing that came up was like, what happens when you win? I hadn't thought about that at all. I was like, I don't know. Here's some things like maybe it just ends, maybe it loops. I, I don't know, just like jotting down ideas. But when I was doing that, I was like, oh, you know, that makes me think of some things back to like the progressions thing. So I was like, okay, what? What makes an early dungeon different than a later one? So I was thinking maybe it's size. I brainstormed this idea of like maybe dungeons have floors and the earlier ones have one floor. You know, later ones you have to go through multiple floors. Uh, that made me think back to economy. Like, you know, if you if this is structured in seasons like multiple plays, what do you get for beating a whole season? I was like, I don't know. Here's some ideas. Are there consumables in the game? Are there unlocks? Like, this was stuff that was prompted by thinking about sessions. So I did all of this exercising. And now it's time for science. Now it's time for me to figure out what is that hard question that's coming out of all of this that, that I don't know. And for me, a common thing that kept coming up was, uh, you know, there's no character upgrades in this. It's just using stuff in your environment. So is that fun when you don't have character upgrades? So like all the character progression is dependent on what you can find in the environment. Is that 
Will that work? Would that sustain a long game? And I don't know the answer to this. This is like a hard question. Uh, but the nice thing is, is like, okay, here's where I start. Here's how I know what to work on first. I need to answer this question. Because if the answer is no, then it's back to the drawing board. You know, this, this can't like sustain a full big game. So here's how I would test this question. Um, I would prototype, you know, three to four dungeon loop with some permanent power prop unlocks um, in some way to like keep those powerful props advancing between dungeons. Uh, I need to make the difficulty significantly harder so that you would want or need those props to be able to advance. Um, and then I would play test it and look for like, how does the presence of powerful props change how a player can complete a dungeon? Do players try and keep them? Do they ignore them? Those would be the sorts of things I was looking for. So now I have stuff to do. Uh, I have to prototype some power props. So you know that's a lot of prototyping to do. And here's some ideas I just jotted down. I have to prototype, I have to make the game more difficult. That means I have to work on enemy behavior, enemy variety. I have to work on like the spawning system. I have to work on my health model so it's more clear and more aggressive. So basically, like the point is of doing this exercise, I found the stuff that I don't know about my game, and that gave me a plan for what I have to do. So there's one last tip I want to leave you with, which is the idea of a one-pager. And this is something that Frank Lance, um, if you know him, he said, this is a big long quote, I'm just gonna read it. He says, at some point after your jammy beginning, when you've worked out all your core interactions, the overall shape of the game is starting to coalesce, you should step back and do a one-page roadmap of the game's big picture structure. It can be sketchy, but it should express what the big arc of your game is, the main themes, ideas, how they relate to the core economy of resources and problems, how the game is going to end, stuff like that. And he actually gave me his one pager that he made for the game, paper clips, uh, to sort of illustrate like how he does this. Um, the point is, is like you know, it's it's a very general sketchy roadmap. It fits on one page, but it contains like the whole of what the game is going to be. And I actually made one of these for Slow Down Bull, but it's like a super giant, elaborate like flowchart that's really hard to read. But the point is, like when I got far along enough that all those things started to coalesce, this was really helpful to do to just like think about, okay, how is this loop going to work? All right. So in conclusion, uh, these are like big categories that I find really helpful for thinking about when you're making big games, especially if you find yourself stuck and not sure what you can work, what you should be working on next. Uh, remember the story stack. Remember how like that fantasy is a foundation for all your other decisions. It's really helpful to have a strong fantasy. Uh, all those questions I had that you can ask yourself, I have a link to a page where they're all just listed out. Um, and search for the hardest questions. Don't be lured by known problem spaces. Answering those hard questions first helps you decide what to work on first. Uh, and you know the goal is, again, getting yourself unstuck. If you're making a big game, you're feeling like you, you don't know what to do next, uh, these, these can help you move past that paralysis. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Mm.